Hello on Fulbertson, this is Anton and today we're going to be discussing some of the most recent discoveries that may drastically change our approach of looking for extraterrestrial life somewhere out there. Mostly because for many decades we used our sun and the solar activity as a model for understanding stars. And as a result of this, for many years now, scientists have actually mostly been focusing on stars that are most likely to contain terrestrial planets, in this case the stars were referred to as red dwarfs, as the most likely source for some kind of a habitable planet out there. And at the same time, the researchers assume that discovering stars with the most amount of terrestrial planets, and especially planets in the habitable zone, may give us the highest chance of potentially finding life. Which is why a lot of recent search has been mostly focusing on stars like Trappist-1 and Proxima Centauri, because we know both of these star systems contain terrestrial planets in their own habitable zones. And so when we look in our galaxy, we find that most common types of stars, the M-type stars, also known as red dwarfs, at least in theory, should give us the highest chance for possibly discovering something. But some of the most recent studies seem to disagree with this. And that's because these relatively small stars may actually be some of the most violent in the entire galaxy. And this is essentially what we're going to be discussing today because just a few days ago, scientists released a new study and managed to achieve something they've been trying to achieve for several decades. The first unambiguous detection of a massive stellar explosion, specifically a coronal mass ejection or a CME, from a star that's not our sun. Just as a reminder, CMEs is what usually causes things like aurora on our planet. And by the way, I think yesterday or last night, there were quite a few aurora visible in North America. But unlike on planet Earth, this wasn't just some kind of a minor burp, this was a blast traveling so fast and with so much power that apparently it contained enough energy to possibly completely strip atmosphere from any nearby planet. And so, in order to understand why this detection is so important, we first need to start with a little bit of context. Let's first discuss red dwarfs, also known as M-type stars. And so once again, these are the smallest and the coolest stars, and also the stars that are most likely going to survive the longest, with some of them potentially living for trillions of years, assuming the universe survives that long. And these stars are practically everywhere. Most of the stars in the Milky Way are red dwarfs, and some of the most exciting terrestrial planets discovered in the last decade were all discovered around these objects. As a matter of fact, all of the terrestrial planets in the habitable zone of any other star, except for the Sun, seem to orbit a red dwarf. Okay, what about CMEs or coronal mass ejections? Now, these are usually confused with flares, and that's because usually both happen at the same time, but flares produce radiation such as X-rays, whereas a typical CME, like the one you see right here, is literally a massive burp from the Sun carrying actual matter that then interacts with the upper atmosphere. And so when such an event strikes our planet, here's roughly how it affects the magnetosphere. This is a simulation of the famous Carrington event that affected the planet back in 1859. And this is of course the most powerful CME known to us. And today CMEs represent the largest contributors to space weather, and we kind of of course assume that this is something similar that happens everywhere out there. So we assume that red dwarfs also have these as well. And though for Earth they normally contribute in creating beautiful aurora, for other planets like Mars, their impact also contributes to eroding planetary atmospheres. This is something we discussed a few years back because we finally had evidence of atoms escaping from Mars as predicted by various models. But the challenge for red dwarfs is simple geometry. Their conventional habitable zone, or basically the zone where we expect liquid water, is much much closer to the star, with this image illustrating how close they have to be which means that planets around red dwarfs are naturally subjected to potentially much more frequent and more energetic attacks from the Sun, which in theory could be more devastating than what we see happening on Mars. But for years scientists could only infer the existence of CMEs by detecting associated eruptive events like flares or occasional coronal dimming. So we've never actually seen a physical CME happening anywhere except for the Sun. Here scientists needed some kind of a tracer or basically a strategy to detect these directly. Something that could indeed prove that plasma was disconnected from the star and was moving toward the planet. And this is where we have our new research with a major breakthrough from November of 2025. This is coming from an active red dwarf, approximately 140 light years away from us, referred to as STKM 1-1262. And here we have direct evidence for plasma escape coming from the detection of a type 2 radio burst, which is sort of similar to a sonic boom from a stellar explosion generated by a shock wave from the CME traveling through a stellar atmosphere. And so the presence of this type 2 burst allows us to definitively conclude that hot plasma was released and very likely entered interplanetary medium. 
This was detected by using both radio telescopes and X-ray telescopes, and specifically LOFAR radio telescope and ESA's XMM Newton. With this research basically developing a new data processing method, crucial for isolating the signal. But importantly, it wasn't really just the detection in this case, it was the strength that's kind of surprising. By determining the star's temperature, rotation and X-ray brightness, they were able to figure out how strong this was. And first was the speed. Here the shock velocity was approximately 2400 km per second or 1500 miles per second, which is faster than pretty much most of the CMEs in the solar system. Only about 5% of all of these ejections we've seen coming from the sun were just as fast. And so plasma here was moving super fast with a lot of energy. But on top of this speed it was also super dense. Dense enough to completely strip away atmosphere from any orbiting planet, which is honestly kind of shocking. As a matter of fact, the actual observations seem to be at least 10 times larger than some of the previous models and previous theoretical predictions, implying that some of the red dwarfs and possibly all red dwarfs can sometimes produce emissions that are powerful enough to completely strip everything away. Here the research goes into a little bit more detail trying to calculate how much pressure this would create, and in essence for any potential planet in the habitable zone, the pressure from this event was strong enough to compress a planetary magnetosphere so much that even a powerful magnetosphere would be squeezed all the way to the surface of the planet, basically collapsing it completely and exposing the atmosphere to being directly stripped away by all of this stellar material. And this provides us with a very important direct evidence for the impact of these solar events that most likely happen around most red dwarfs and very likely affect all of these terrestrial planets we've discovered. And so for TRAPPIST-1 for example, if such an event were to happen here, it would very likely leave most of these planets completely barren. And interestingly, as we've learned from some of the previous videos about the system, right now the nearest three planets seem to actually possibly not have anything. And maybe this is why. Maybe this particular star was also just as violent and left these planets completely barren. And so the intensity of this event highlights the inherently volatile nature of red dwarfs and especially the ones that are still young. This doesn't seem to happen as frequently around older stars, but it still happens. And interestingly, red dwarfs, especially those that rotate quickly, usually contain the highest magnetic activity. And for this star we know that it spins pretty fast. A single rotation takes 1.24 days. For comparison, the Sun takes over two weeks. And so here the rapid spin is crucial for amplifying many of these magnetic fields and for then creating these very powerful magnetic emissions. And even based on some of the preliminary calculations, scientists believe that the magnetic field around this star seems to be at least 300 times stronger than around the Sun. And that's despite the fact that it's much much smaller and much less massive. But this is on top of several other recent observations, including the one from slightly different stars, confirming that the red dwarfs exhibit much higher flare activity compared to the Sun and thus very likely much higher coronal mass ejections as well, with the fast spinning stars obviously producing more flares and more CMEs. As a matter of fact, not so long ago, scientists observed what's referred to as a super flare observed on a different red dwarf system, referred to as DG Canum Venaticorum. The stars whose flare you can see right here have these very very bright, very massive explosions that seem to happen several times per year. And in this case it was calculated to be approximately 10,000 times more powerful than the largest solar flare from any object ever seen. And so quite a few of these objects may not be really that hospitable after all and possibly destroy planetary environments pretty quickly, basically leaving planets completely barren. But some other studies give us just a little bit of hope because apparently some of these active dwarfs release their energy slightly differently. In other words, they don't seem to all produce the same types of emissions. Some highly active stars dissipate energy via very frequent low energy flares, whereas other stars may store energy for longer periods before releasing them in these very rare sudden giant events. Events we call super flares. And so there seems to be some kind of a fundamental difference in how these stars seem to release energy. But based on these observations, we can now pretty certainly say that you would not want to live on a planet around these objects because it just becomes super unpredictable and potentially very dangerous. And so the existence of these very powerful and very frequent flares and CMEs introduces a severe challenge to the habitability of worlds orbiting red dwarfs. And even though about a decade ago scientists decided to focus on trying to find as many of these planets as possible, because the chance for a habitable zone planet was the highest, and technically they were correct, we've discovered quite a few planets in these zones, and we've discussed them in some of the previous videos in the description, but it still doesn't mean that these planets are going to contain liquid water. 
because this new data shows us that atmospheric environment may be stripped pretty quickly from these planets, and thus the existence of liquid water is not guaranteed. So if a typical red dwarf constantly bombards one of these planets with these CMEs and very powerful flares, the planet may lose its atmosphere within just a few million years, making it resemble Mercury, an uninhabitable rock with no chance for habitability ever. And that's despite the fact that it's in the perfect distance away from the star. And so all of this new research essentially focuses on something that's sometimes ignored, space weather. And confirms once again that unlike the sun, many stars out there are just super extreme. But in terms of the actual scientific achievements here, well, we now don't have to just rely on theories and models because researchers have now developed models that allow us to physically measure some of these events around other stars, and we now have empirical benchmarks from which to measure other stars around us. As a matter of fact, I hope someone does this for some of the most famous stars like Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to us. And so overall, the detection of this coronal mass ejection and the super powerful flare from the other star potentially marks the opening for a new astronomical field, a field of stellar weather measurements. And so here by measuring these events around other stars, we might have better tools to eventually predict what sort of planets might be best after all, and where we might potentially find life somewhere out there. But right now the only confirmation we have is the destructive potential of red dwarfs and their very volatile, very dangerous nature. And so maybe with some of the future missions, such as the Square Kilometer Array being built in Australia and South Africa, we may be able to spot tens to hundreds of these events, eventually answering some of these questions in regards to habitability. And maybe one day discovering that Earth 2.0. Right now though, Earth 1.0 is still the best we have. And so, you know, go recycle or something, I guess. I don't know, I'm not the best to talk about this because I am basically drinking Starbucks right here. So, you know, you can blame plastic pollution on me as well. But either way though, here we can now confidently say that the complexity of stellar activity is not just something we can easily predict with stellar diagrams or with some kind of a theoretical models. This is indeed something that needs to be observed and detected in order to be understood. But importantly, this also reminds us that the idea of habitability is not just about location. It is also about the activity from the star, it's about the surface of the planet and geologic activity, and possibly about so much more, including the actual composition. Which is why we'll be discussing this more in a lot of other videos, and which is why you might want to consider subscribing. Either way, thank you for watching, check out all of the studies in the description, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads, and can DM me directly, or by joining a channel membership that grants you early access. You can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.